Hayes' theorem and atheism. Last week, we reviewed a 2007 paper by Eugene Koonin, which calculated using overly generous assumptions, way overly generous assumptions, that the probability of life arising from an RNA world was less than 1 in uh, 10 to the 1018th. How many universes do we need for that? Uh, well, obviously 10 to 1018 universes to make it even. Um, why in the world would anyone believe that life arose without an intelligent designer? I mean, if those are the chances, how can you just say, no, but it couldn't have happened? Well, it has to do, for most people, with Bayes' theorem and prior probabilities. This is not just my conjecture, although I've suspected it for some time. Um, this is actually agreed to by some of the more insightful atheists, and I'm going to give you an example. We will look at some conversations. Uh, but to understand the thought process, first we need to look at Bayes' theorem itself. What in the world is Bayes' theorem? Well, Bayes' theorem is named after Thomas Bayes, a Presbyterian minister who had previously written on calculus. Back then they were more polymath than they are now. Uh, and whose work on statistics was actually published uh, posthumously. Uh, Bayes' work was mostly on updating probabilities. But that means, um, I'll give you an example in just a little bit, but I'm going to give you the theorem first, and it's very simple, and it's very easy to prove. We are given the probability of A given B. That is to say, we know that of the totality of B, what proportion also has A in it? And what we want to know is the probability of B given A. That is to say, the proportion that has A and B in it of the total of A. And uh, uh, I'm going to give you an example to bring home exactly what we're talking about in just a minute. But what Bayes noted is that for any system, and this works universally, composed of these four partitions, that is, there's A, there's B, there's their intersection, and then there's the rest of it, which is neither A nor B, that you can say that the probability of B given A is the number of the area, the number of people, the number of individuals that are in A and B divided by the entire of A, including A and B, of course. And that equals A and B divided by B times B divided by the total number times the total number divided by A. Or, to be very precise, the probability of A given B, pardon me, the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B divided by the probability of A. And if you look at it that way, it becomes pretty logical. That is, B divided by the total is the probability of getting B. And T divided by A is the inverse of the probability of A. And it follows very naturally. Well, with that, you can go a long ways. For example, supposing you were not in a high-risk group, and your chances of having HIV are about 1 in uh, 100,000. Supposing that you um, were taking care of a patient, and you got a needle stick. And immediately everybody gets excited and they test you for AIDS with a little 20-minute tester. Okay? Now, the patient actually turned out later not to have AIDS themselves, so you don't know what's going to happen with that. But as part of that protocol, they did this little instant test 
and they found out that you were positive for AIDS. Should you panic? Well, Bayes' theorem can help. Now, this is going to take a little math. Um, first of all, I'm going to call people who are, uh, get the test results positive are going to be T. And people who have the disease, I'm going to call D. So the sensitivity, if the test is positive, if, it, if, the disease, if you have the disease, is the probability of the test given the disease which is the probability of test and disease divided by everybody who has the disease. Okay, the specificity is to say it, the test is negative if you don't have the disease. Or the probability of not having the test given that you don't have the disease, which is equal to the probability of the test and the, or not the test and not the disease divided by the probability of not the disease total. Now, um, sensitivity and specificity are things that you can actually test, and when you get done, you can say, this test has such and such a sensitivity or such and such a specificity. And they're generalizable, usually, unless the test subjects are wildly different from, the, uh, from yourself. But in general, most humans, uh, biochemistry is pretty much the same. Okay. So we're going to start with Bayes' theorem. What we want to know is, given that you have a positive test, what's the probability you have the disease? And of course, by Bayes' theorem, it's the probability that uh, you, uh, the test is positive given the disease times the probability of having the disease divided the, by the probability of having the test positive. But you don't know what these things are. All you know is the sensitivity, the specificity, and eventually you, will, uh, you need to know one other thing in order to make this work. And that is that the that you know what risk group you were in to begin with. What is the probability of you having the disease without taking the test at all? Okay, now you'll notice right away that the probability test given the disease is equal to the sensitivity. So what we're going to do is we're going to expand this a little bit, take out that, and put in the sensitivity in its place. Fair enough? Okay, the next thing we're going to note is we're given the probability of having the disease. So we can turn that yellow, which means we know it. And that means that all we have to worry about is the probability of having the test. Well, now this is where it gets just a little complicated. Okay, first of all, we know that the probability of having the test positive is equal to the probability of having the test positive and also having the disease, plus the probability of having the test positive and not having the disease. Because having the disease, you either have the disease or not, right? Okay. So, um, we can also state that, and this is just a restatement of the sensitivity thing, and that is the probability of having the test given the disease is equal to the probability of having the test and the disease divided by the probability of having the disease, right? Okay, so we're going to multiply by the probability of the disease and we're going to get the probability of the test and disease equals the probability of having the test given the disease times the probability of the disease. Okay, but now we note uh, that the probability of the test given the disease is equal to the sensitivity, again. So we're going to take that out and put the sensitivity in its place again. And we note that the probability of having the disease 
is something we also know, so we're going to put that in the yellow. And now, one of our two terms for the probability of t uh, is probability of t and d is something we, we know. So we're going to expand that. We're going to take it out and move the sensitivity times the probability of the disease in its place. Okay? Um, in addition to that, we know the probability of not having the disease is in, includes the probability of having the test positive and not having the disease, and the test negative and not having the disease. Now, remember, these are true regardless of the sensitivity or specificity. Whatever they happen to be, this is always true. So uh, we're trying to find something that's mathematically perfect that we don't have to worry about mistakes. Okay? So this looks a little bit more complicated, but um, we can rearrange it by just simply swapping the two ends. And then we can subtract the probability of not having the test and not having the disease from both sides to give us the probability of test and not disease is equal to the probability of not disease minus the probability of not test and not disease. This looks kind of complicated, but uh, it actually turns out to be quite helpful. Uh, I'm going to move it up and work on it some more. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to spread those a little bit. I'm going to put parentheses around them, and I'm going to multiply them by the probability of not having the disease but then divide each of those little pieces by the probability of not having the disease. So we're basically simply multiplying by one. Okay. But now we find something interesting, and that is that the probability of disease divided by the probability, pardon me, the probability of not having the disease divided by the probability of not having the disease is equal to exactly one. On top of that, we notice that the specificity is equal to uh, the probability of not having the test, uh, pardon me, the test being negative and not having the disease, divided by the probability of, having, of not having the disease. So we will take that out and move the specificity in place, and then we'll kind of collapse our, uh, our uh, formula. And our final step, besides collecting terms, is going to be that the probability of the not having the disease plus the probability of having the disease is equal to 1. You either have the disease or you don't, but not both. If we subtract the probability of having the disease, we have the probability of not having disease equals 1 minus the probability of having the disease. And now, we note that the probability of not having the disease is equal to the probability of not having the disease, so we can erase that and put uh, 1 minus the probability of having the disease. But interestingly enough, the probability of not having the disease is something we know. So now we have an equation that has everything in it known. So now we, uh, we take we take that and we, we erase it and we move what it's equal to into its place. Now this is going to get a little longer, so what we're going to do is we're going to shorten our sensitivity and specificity so you can read them. Um, they'll be abbreviated. And then we'll move the uh, equations back together and uh, finally the probability of t equals the probability of t, so we will erase that, and we will move the sensitivity and specificity. So we have now the final equation. All of those things are now known. Okay? Now, 
In our particular AIDS test, uh, there are different numbers that are given for them, but they're all in this general range, so I've selected one of the better ones. And let's suppose the sensitivity is 0.997. That means you do 1,000 people who have the disease, and the test will give you three mistakes. And the specificity is 0.999. That means you have 1,000 people who don't have the disease, and it will give you one mistake. That's a pretty good test. Well, what happens if your baseline is 10%? If you take it and crank the numbers through, you will find that you get a pos uh, your post-test risk. You know, pre-test was 10%. You have now moved up to over 99% that you have the disease. You've got to be worried at that point. Okay, what about if your baseline risk is 1 in 10,000 or 100,000? If it's 0.001% and you get a positive test and you put the same numbers in and you turn the crank, you get 0.987%, which is less than 1%, less than 1 in 100 that you have the disease. You shouldn't sweat it too much. Oh, I'd probably get one more test to be sure, but you probably don't have it. Notice that the prior probability makes all the difference in the world in how you interpret the test. That means that before you evaluate a test result, you have to know what the prior probability is. And that's the essence of Bayes' theorem, is that it makes a difference where you started from as well as how good the test is. So, Bayes' theorem and atheism, back to our conversation. It starts at the website given, uh, where Mark Frank mentions probabilities in comment 21 and prior probabilities in comment 32, which will be stolen shortly, and so you'll get to see that. Again, recommending Bayesian analysis at 36, so he's saying, yes, this is what we need to do. And comment 32 was partially copied to how is ID different. Um, uh, Barry Arrington published this, and uh, he said, Mark Frank writes in a comment on a prior post, which we gave, when reconstructing an evolutionary past, I would say that scientists are doing two things which correspond to my Bayesian analysis. They are present proposing explanations that, one, might well have happened. The prior probability is acceptable two, would have had a good chance of producing what we observe. The likelihood is acceptable. And uh, Barry Arrington says, when reconstructing a biological past, I would say that ID scientists are doing two things which correspond to Mark Frank's Bayesian analysis. They are proposing explanations that, one, might well have happened. The prior probability is acceptable. Two, would have had a good chance of producing what we observe. The likelihood is acceptable. Mark Frank, do you agree that ID proponents and Darwinist, Darwinian researchers are employing identical modes of reasoning? Uh, yeah, I mean, okay. So Mark Frank, his first answer, by the way, there were some other commentators first, and we don't have time to go through everything, um, says, Barry, ID is different because it avoids giving an explanation to which a prior probability or indeed a likelihood can be assigned. All it offers is intelligence. But this is territory which we have covered thousands of times over the years. Do you really want to go over it again? Well, my personal answer was, yes, we do want to go over it again. Mark, since you think we need a prior probability for our intelligence explanation, what do you think is a reasonable prior probability of the existence of space aliens, of a god or gods? Well, I'd take a uh, hundred to one against. What do you think? Now, a lot of you would instinctively say, well, why not just 50%? But, you know, 100 to 1. Mark Frank comments, I don't think you need to be able to give a specific prior probability to an explanation, although it helps, but you do have to have something to work with. The prior for a god of, go of gods, I think that's or gods, who wanted to design life, I would put it close to zero. 
there's no reason for supposing it other than the fact that there is life and it needs explaining. Space aliens not much higher for the same reason. Um, this brought on a few comments, um, including Hex, whoever he is, H-E-K-S. I'm interested. What if someone had a reason to believe that a non-human intelligence existed that had nothing to do with the existence of life? And what if they thought that their reasons for believing such an intelligence existed were very strong? Such that the existence of the intelligence was assigned a very high, pri high prior probability for the purpose of Bayesian analysis. How do you think this would affect a Bayesian analysis of the probability that intelligence is the most probable explanation for the appearance of purposeful design in life? Might raise it a little bit. Uh, and, and Vivid Blue commented, uh, and again, I'm not reading the whole thing. The prior of, of, for a god of gods who wanted to design life, I would put it close to zero. She's quoting Mark Frank, of course. Uh, Mark, can you give us the mathematical calculation so we can see how you arrived at close to zero? <laughs> and then my comment. Mark Frank, um, and again, I quoted, um, I don't think you need to be able to give a specific prior probability, but it helps. And they said, yes, that's exactly what we need. Something to work with. So what is it? One in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in a million, one in ten to the twenty-seventh. What number would you start with? Absolute zero? And then I commented the prior for a god of gods who wanted to design life. I put it close to zero and so forth. And I said, yes, uh, other, uh, because... No reason for supposing it other than the fact that there is life and it needs explaining. And I said, yes, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the show? Kind of an important fact uh, to be ignoring. And then Thomas too, at comment 25, said something worthwhile. Mark Frank, uh, wouldn't the classical empirically based cosmological arguments from causation, in other words, the creation of the universe, give us a basis for assigning some cautious but reasonable priors. Uh, maybe it's reasonably probable. Alternatively, we could conceive of assigning priors based upon our ignorance. To everything we do not know, we assign an equal likelihood to start with. And Mark Frank says, okay, in, respect to, in response to the request from Vivid Blue and Hex, a quick word on Bayesian priors for an intelligent source of life. I have done this several times before, so please understand if I don't spend much time on it. You need to be clear that uh, what the proposed explanation is. If it is the Christian God, then some of you will clearly have a much higher prior than I do. So it is reasonable for you to believe it, uh, in it as an explanation for life. You just need to recognize this is the explanation for which you have evidence. If the explanation is intelligence, then on theory, you need to sum up the prior probabilities of all possible intelligences multiplied by the probability of that intelligence creating life, I might add, on Earth. Uh, and he says, a profoundly meaningless ex exercise. Why is it meaningless? Well, maybe because it doesn't give the answer he wants. But why is my prior for a Christian God effectively zero? Because I see zero evidence for it. What is the probability of something existing for which there is no evidence? I would say that it is effectively zero given the infinite range of things that might exist but for which there is no evidence. By effectively zero, I mean that rationally it should be discounted as a possibility and that it is lower than any number you can give. Although it is conceivable, so I am reluctant to say categorically it is zero. But this is undergraduate or even high school philosophizing. Let's put it more simply. If there is to be some reason for hypothesizing an explanation for the origin of life, then there has to be some reason for supposing that explanation exists other than that it was capable of creating life. So my response is, uh, Mark Frank, thank you for your honesty. You are unwilling to put the Christian God's prior at exactly zero because that sounds and is dogmatic. But you need to make it a very tiny number in order to overcome the high improbability of life arising spontaneously. We can now see what drives your position. I won't argue further. To the rest, note what is happening. Mark called for a Bayesian analysis. This is appropriate. He noted that the priors are very important. He is right. 
For him, the priors, in fact, are doing all the work. What he wanted to do is to say that with low enough priors, one can ignore the evidence against life arising spontaneously. He is right. What he didn't want to come out and say, but has now, is that in order for the final evidence to come out his way, low posterior probability that any intelligence, including the Christian God, some other God or gods or aliens produced life, the priors have to be infinitesimal. One can run the Bayesian analysis in reverse. If the probability of H given E, of the final pr probability of the hypothesis given the evidence is equal to the probability of the evidence happening given as the hypothesis, multiplied by the probability of the hypothesis happening before the evidence is looked at, divided by the probability of the evidence happening, which is the standard Bayesian analysis, it means that you can solve for probability that the hypothesis was true before you got started. That is the prior probability. Now if we put some numbers to that, the probability of that the evidence happening that life happens, uh, life exists in a given universe assuming that God is reasonably likely to create life and that life is improbable in a godless universe, which I think are both reasonable assumptions, is just about equal to the probability of H. If H is much greater than, or much greater than 1 minus H and therefore you can say probability of 1 minus H over E, that is the probability that, that life didn't require a god, is approximately equal to the probability that uh, uh, 1 minus h equal, uh, pardon me, divided by the probability of, and there's a missing parenthesis there, uh, E given h. That means that if the probability of life existing by spontaneous generation is 10 to the 3 at minus 300, an extremely liberal or large number, then for the probability of God or aliens to be reasonably remote, say 1%, so you can say that 99% chance that, that, that um, there isn't such a thing. Um, the prior for no intelligent design has to be 1 minus 10 to the minus 302. And the prior probability of intelligent design has to be 10 to the minus 302, or a very, very, very small number. There are 10 to the 80th particles in the universe, just to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about. That sounds ridiculous and certainly not a rational position. But it has the weakness that if we discover that the real probability of life arising by chance is actually 10 to the minus 600 instead, the probability of the chance hypothesis now goes down to 10 to the minus 298. In other words, suddenly with the prior, uh, the prior probability wasn't set low enough and now we have high probability that life originated by some kind of design. That is why he didn't want to say the prior probability. He didn't want to explicitly recognize how close-minded one has to be to ignore the evidence surrounding the origin of life. It's much easier to go the Lewontin route. We simply cannot allow a divine foot in the door. But that sounds too much like science versus anti-religion. Those of you who point out that there is a small matter of the origin of the universe make the appropriate point that this assigning an infinitesimal prior probability to the existence of God is not really warranted given the facts. And that point, at that point, the argument against God goes down in flames. The same is true for those of us who have experienced God's action in our lives. But even without them, the argument from the existence of life, of life alone can be only countered by multiple universes where anything goes, denial of the improbability of life, appeal to unknown laws, or obfuscation. Mark has thankfully removed the fourth option. And Mark Frank responds, he says, one of the more annoying habits of ID proponents on this form is telling me what my motives are for presenting an argument rather than addressing the argument. Well, I'd like to have him address the argument. So my response was, Mark, uh, if I have incorrectly attributed motives to you, feel free to state which ones are in error, and I will be happy to retract those statements. 
I thought I was addressing the argument. Again, if you feel otherwise, let me know why and we can discuss <coughs> that. My point was that you've given a prior for intelligent design that is not measurably different from zero. That is all. If you agree, we understand each other. And so Mark Frank says, Paul, let's leave my motives out of it. Notice, no comment about I got the motives wrong. And then he quotes, my point is that you've given a prior for intelligent design that's not measurably different from zero. He's quoting me, of course. If, uh, um, he says, I have given a prior for a Christian God that is not measurably different from zero, and I hope explained how I came to that conclusion. I'm not sure what a prior for intelligent design means. Do you mean a prior for intelligent beings existing somewhere in the universe when life began? That is relatively high, but the likelihood of any such form designing life on Earth is extremely low. So my, my final comment in this particular uh, thread was, um, behold the power of methodological naturalism. Science must at all costs, and that's emphasized, adhere to this rule. And if this rule is followed, no evidence can ever come out of science that supports the supernatural. Therefore, if one follows science that is practiced by this definition, one will never find evidence for the supernatural. So when someone points out that the origin of life seems to be require intelligence, one's response can be, aliens are not very likely as a good explanation, and there's no evidence for the supernatural, and therefore random processes must have done it, regardless of how little evidence there is for that possibility. So one is justified in applying methodological naturalism, and the circle is complete. There really is not much point in discussing the likelihood of intelligent design with someone who has decided that no matter what the evidence is, he's not going to believe in the possibility of a god. And he won't even believe in intelligent aliens unless he finds their factory and recognizes it. Lots of people here complain that evolution doesn't predict anything. They are wrong. Quantum mechanics and relativity are only provably accurate to less than 20 decimal places. Darwinian evolution is accurate to gazillions of decimal places. Then uh, um, somebody who calls himself Karis Focus um, uh, wrote a, a piece that was entitled The Bottom Line Issues Exchanged Between MF, which is Mark Frank, and Paul Geem et al. over prior probabilities in the old I see no evidence trick. And he basically quoted some of the th things you've already seen. Um, and it, uh, in the comments, I made a comment myself. Uh, Kara's focus, thanks for noticing. It is important to realize that some people who claim to be amenable to evidence, in fact, are not so. In calculus, we say that a limit for a number which is smaller than any other number is zero. So from a calculus perspective, Mark Frank's position is indistinguishable from that of a dogmatic atheist. Evidence really doesn't matter. Once we realize that, we can quit trying to persuade him. We can also quit regarding him as an unbiased observer. Fortunately, Mark Frank is honest enough to admit this, as some of our other denizens are not. It is fascinating to watch massive amounts of mental energy being spent to avoid the conclusion that the facts are as they are, and that these people are biased. Mark made it easy when he brought up prior probabilities, which is why I highlighted that aspect of the discussion. That doesn't mean we should never listen to such people, but it does mean that we should not expect to satisfy them, as if they have already dogmatically ruled out what turns out to be the correct explanation, nothing we do is going to change that. This also means that they should not be given veto power over appropriate conclusions. Uh, Vivid Blue commented, K.F. Paul Mung, according to M.F., there is zero evidence for God, and, rationa and rationally we must discount the possibility. This makes all theists to be irrational. How absurd. I would guess that what Mark means by evidence is material evidence in the order of God appearing so that M.F. can observe and collect God's material makeup, you know, like Thor and Zeus. Spelling is as was in the, uh, in the uh, original post. Paul, as you rightly point out, MF's priors are driven by his metaphysical positions and evidence be damned. 
but we already knew this. Now, the existence of God is not mandated by ID. In fact, ID is not about the designer. It's rather about identifying design by something other than purely law-like, unintelligent processes. But to d infer de design is hardly irrational. Why would someone like Dawkins say that things only have the appearance of design if there was no evidence that things might be, in fact, be designed? That, uh, where is this appearance of design manifested and wh where is the evidence that there is such an appearance if there is zero evidence for design in the first place? Why does it look design if it isn't? Now, I like and respect Mark Frank, but he is intellectually dishonest. I don't think he is a dishonest person, but intellectually for someone to say that theists are irrational, that's BS. Wrong maybe, but irrational, come on. I don't think he gave his priors for ID would be interested in hearing what those are, but would not hold my breath. Well, actually, he did give his prior, so basically it's indistinguishable from zero. And Mark Frank comments, I seem to be this, this subject of the discussion here, so let me clarify a couple of things. And first, to me, Mark Frank's uh, position is indistinguishable from that of a dogmatic atheist, evidence doesn't really matter, and so forth. He says, I think a dogmatic atheist would dismiss all evidence for a Christian God a prior. I hope I wouldn't do that. I just haven't seen any so far. Including the origin of life itself. All observers have some kind of prior beliefs and are to that extent biased. So he does recognize his own bias. And then to Vivid Blue, he says, I, uh, quoting her again, uh, I think it's her but I don't know for sure. I don't think he is a dishonest person, but intellectually for someone to say that theists are irrational, that's BS, wrong maybe, but irrational, come on. He says, I am not aware of having said theists are irrational. This would imply thinking some of the people I love and respect most are irrational. Some of my best friends are theists. Um, I just think they're wrong. Where did you get this idea? And Vivid Blue comes back, you ask where I get Got such an idea, I got it from you. You stated there is zero evidence for God and we must rationally discount the possibility of his existence. If this is so, the opposite of rationality is irrationality. If we must rationally discount the possibility not to do so is irrational. And then uh, Mark Frank comes back with a very interesting comment. He's, he quotes Vivid Blue that we just read. And he says, no, I didn't. I said, I, and that's emphasized, I see zero evidence for the Christian God. The discussion was about my prior beliefs. I absolutely recognize that different people have different ideas about what counts as evidence, and also have different personal experiences that may weigh as evidence for them, but not me. This is not irrational. Rationality comes in when going from evidence to conclusions. So it would be irrational of me to believe in a Christian God while also believing there's no evidence. It would be irrational not to believe in God if you believe there was strong evidence. Also, some lines of argument from evidence to conclusion might on examination prove to be irrational for either of us. That doesn't mean that either of us are fundamentally irrational people. We just can make mistakes, I guess. Anyway, I think a great many people do not think as clearly as Mark Frank. They ignore the vast improbabilities required by the hypothesis of the spontaneous origin of life. Sometimes this is through ignorance and sometimes it's deliberate. If we get people to recognize that they believe in spite of the evidence, in my opinion, we've probably done everything we can. Any further work, I think, is up to the Holy Spirit. And he's probably going to move in ways that don't necessarily always uh, require a logical argument. This is the one place where you love people into the kingdom, I think. They can accept the idea that they might have been wrong about the logic. Philosophically, it is tempting to claim, and a lot of people do claim, that science is the study of the intersubjectively constant, that to which anyone can agree with, regardless of his or her bias. Science is objective. And the closest thing we have to objective is you and I and everybody else agrees with it. That is only true if one's prior probabilities for an outcome are measurably different from zero. 
Otherwise, science can be held hostage to the ideologue. Atheists that refuse to put a measurably non-zero prior probability to supernatural intelligence should not be given veto power over science, let alone your personal belief. This is particularly true when they call you to be reasonable and put the prior probability for God at less than one. You know, 99%, but not one, because one is dogmatic then they can't be dogmatic in the opposite direction. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Now my own personal belief is this, and you will notice that it is not a dogmatic position. I don't have a closed mind. The door to atheism is not locked and barred. I could go there. But just outside the door is a huge pile of junk called Objections to Spontaneous Generation of Life. And another one called personal experience, and another called the origin of the universe, and another called the reliability of the Bible. There are others. But you clear away those major ones. And I'll be willing to follow you through that door. But one thing. Don't tell me that I should have faith that the pile will disappear. You have to reasonably demonstrate it. Right now, the evidence is overwhelming. According to Kunin, a liberal estimate is 10 to the minus 1,018. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Uh, I wonder if you could go over the. Uh, I wonder if you could go over the Bayesian uh, hypothesis testing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it takes it takes quite a while to go through it. Uh, the math. Just briefly that slide where you have that. Um. Okay. Uh, let's see. Probability of the hypothesis being true given the prior probability, so whatever. You want the, the final one at the end, or do you want the... Um, no, no, not the medical one, not the HIV. Yeah. Uh, the, the you want the Bayes uh, theorem itself. This one here. You want the AB one. Oh, the atheist? That's the one. Yeah. That's this one. Um, right, probably here. That one? Now, I, I didn't carefully derive all of that stuff. I realized, but I was hoping that we could actually plot, plot the numbers in there, uh, actual numbers, and find out what the P of H actually comes out. Well, as I, as I said in the next slide, uh, Let's see. Um, if you start out with um, 10 to the minus 300, your prior, prior probability has to be 10 to the minus 300 plus uh, whatever factor you want. I, I would like to just see those numbers plopped into the equation. Uh, but uh, never mind. I can work it out on my own. Yeah, but they they come out they come out so close to these numbers. I mean, it, you know, uh, you will notice that like, like uh, you know the one was one percent. It's basically multiplying by a thousand. Um, 
and and that's you know that gives you a very close estimate for what you're supposed well, to have. The reason, why Just, the reason why I'm thinking of that is because if the 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 probabilities of the fitness of the universe for life are such that people have to hypothesize 10 to the power of 500 universes to make the probability of life originating in one of them, even once, uh, satisfactory, uh, then we should uh, have some numbers to plop into this kind of equation yeah. that, that would actually test the hypothesis itself. Well, you, you'll notice that when people get pinned down on multiple universes, they talk about numbers like 10 to the 10 to the 123. Some of them will talk about infinite universes. And at that point, you're completely beyond the number system at all. Uh, you know, basically, basically what these people are saying is that <coughs> in order to get our answer, you have to inflate the probabilities to, you know, incredible odds. What you're basically saying, again, is that you have to start with the prior probability of God that is down in that uh, 10, to the, 10 to the minus 123. Just, you know, humongous numbers. Uh, and that brings me to another interesting phenomenon that I've observed from time to time. And that is that I have felt a sense of kindred spirit with some of my atheist colleagues. And what is it that I've, I've, I've sensed about it? Uh, and it is, uh, it, after pondering on it for some time, I've basically come to a conclusion that what, what I liked about some of them is their faithfulness and loyalty. Now, when you, we speak in terms of faithfulness and loyalty, and I could relate to that, and I can admire that, but the moment we begin to think in terms of faithfulness and loyalty, one has to ask oneself, all right, that's, that's noble, but what is it that I'm faithful to? If I am in a Nazi German system, do I still see myself as noble because I'm faithful to the prevailing view of things? No matter how noble I see my faithfulness, there are times when we actually have to lose in order to win. There are times when our faithfulness to a higher standard is tested. So what's that higher standard? Whether we're talking about religion, science, or anything else, ultimately, the only issue that I have been able to come to personally that makes any kind of sense to me in this context is the idea of a faithfulness to truth. However, I'm able to see it, and whenever and wherever I'm able to see it. So, that being the case, it doesn't bother me when I see people who do not see eye to eye with me on some point. What troubles me is when I see duplicity, when I see fudging, deliberate obfuscation of what is obvious. Those are the issues that I find most how should I say, disturbing, regardless of whether they are in religious topics or scientific topics or merely newsworthy items on, in the newspaper. 
As a matter of fact, it bothers me when somebody's duplicitous, even if they're on my side. Oh, regardless, it does. We don't want friends like that. You know what I'm saying? People who are duplicitous when they're friendly to you will continue being duplicitous when it serves their purpose in the opposite direction too. And beyond <laughs> that, know? if you rely on those people, you're uh, going to get burned. Oh, no doubt. Uh, even, if you, even if you're relying on what they're being on your side. That's right. Because people will point out, well, yeah, but they, they fudged it here, they fudged it so there. Yeah, it, it's, like, it's, it's, it's like surrounding yourself with, with, with uh, traps. Yeah. And feeling that you're now fortified. Uh, it works both ways. Uh, so ultimately, that reminds me of something that I believe Sister White pointed out, that the sole purpose, the sole objective, the sole mission that Christ had when he came to be among us was to attract our attention and loyalty to truth above all. And when we see that, when we begin to treasure truth for how it needs to be treasured, how it needs to be valued and sacrificed for, then we will not see our petty differences of viewpoints as important, but rather uh, how we value one another in, and one another's rights to uh, uh, examine the evidence personally. Um, I hope I'm not seeing as totally disagreeing with that, but I think in terms of humanity at large, which we can see and feel and experience, God we cannot see. And Ellen White spoke about saying truth is the ultimate. I don't think, I think Paul got it right. He said there are three things after discussing all sorts of things, three things that are left, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The one thing we as humanity whether we consider ourselves close cousins or not, that we should accept is that love has to be the greatest virtue for humanity. If then faith, which is truth, seeing that which is invisible, or partly invisible, but there may be evidence for it, that's fine. But really, whether we are arguing on the blogs or otherwise, we should have compassion and kindness and tolerance, that is, love for each other. Truth, we can always disagree with. But we should say that the one ingredient all humanity must have towards each other is love. <coughs> I think is one reason for being extra careful not to be snide, not to be um, uh, not to be name calling, not to be you know tell people they're stupid, you know all the kinds of things that it's really tempting to do, um, uh, because you know you run into people like this. Uh, and you find out that uh, Mark Frank says he'd really like to believe in God, he just doesn't see any evidence for it. Um, and I'd like to take him at his word when he says that. Uh, and if there are ten people <laughs> like that and one person I can take them at their word, that one person is worth saving. And that one, pre or more precisely, cooperating with God, who does the actual saving, and um, uh, you know, and those people are probably being attracted because what they see in the believers around them is love, and that's one of the reasons why I say I think this gives you the limits of argument. If one really has a psychological need to deny that God exists, one can do that. One does that at the cost of, of being dogmatic about one's priors, but that's where you go, because you have to. And what changes people's minds, I think, is not so much evidence as the ability to open oneself up to the evidence that's already there. Because what's happening is People are closing themselves off more, more often than not. They're not really being persuaded by the evidence. A few of them are. A few of them have been told, 
and, and they have no clue that there is even another way of looking at it. But I think that most people actually are, uh, they close themselves off because they feel like, you know, God's out to get them. <coughs> and so it's just more convenient if there isn't a God. And, you know, once you have that kind of motivation, well, then you say, well, that's not evidence. Well, that's not evidence. Well, that's not evidence. And pretty soon you have no evidence whatsoever. I do a lot of people love, uh, don't love the truth, but love their fallen man. A lot of times, <coughs> excuse me, I hear <coughs> running around people is, well, we help our neighbor and we do all these good things the Bible teaches. So it doesn't really matter what we think. You can think one thing, I can think another. It's just an excuse for not really paying attention to the truth. Yeah, I, I would just um, call attention to the fact that uh, science does not have to exclude God. Uh, science worked very well for thousands of years, uh, including God in the picture. Uh, More importantly, people like Newton included God in their science. and. It's hard to argue that Newton isn't a scientist, or isn't a good scientist. No, you can do science, including God. Uh, what has happened is a sociological phenomenon, you know, that a century and a half ago, God was excluded from science, and science has redefined itself as being materialistic, purely materialistic, and as such, uh, God is not allowed in the picture. But, the, you know, this is... Uh, you're restricting your horizon of possibilities when you do this. And, and of course, uh, this, this uh, <laughs> Bayes theorem and so on uh, points out how uh, uh, what you're doing does, doesn't work. It, uh, uh, so we, we find ourselves here in uh, a sociological milieu in which we find science extremely successful in certain areas. Uh, extremely speculative in others, uh, and wrong in some others, but in general, science is is uh, uh, better than you know just rolling dice to try and find out truth. Yeah, it it, uh, so it works. We find ourselves in this, but we find ourselves in a science that has limited its outlook, and I, I think it's uh, you're not going to find truth if you keep limiting your outlook. Yeah. Well, just as a comment to what brother mentioned about love, hope, and faith being the, the three biggest. Yes, uh, I agree. Uh, I would like to just compliment what you said by, by pointing out that love delights in truth. Because love operates on truth. Truth is the raw materials to work with to build with. You can't build with fake stuff. You gotta have real things if you want real results. I agree with that, except uh, when you find people, and I, I talked to one just last night, uh, he referred to, he knew I was an Adventist, he referred to, well, you got some crazy ideas here. But he's a nice guy. Couldn't recall. Probably help his neighbor. Like, um, I, I run into people like that all the time because they're not really interested in the truth, but they're going to work their way into the kingdom somehow. There's a comment behind you. Oh, I was just going to comment about what you just said about the, uh, I think it was, um, uh, love operates somehow in truth but anyway um or we're supposed to love the truth that's one thing and that is a very important concept but the bible does say that all things work through love so that's nothing's going to work with if you don't have that you can have all the truth in the world in other words and if you don't have love well then you're you don't have anything really well what it means is that you're missing the central part of truth yeah. 
<laughs> which is love. Yeah. Uh, uh, the reason I bring this to your attention is primarily for one reason, and that is that uh, as you are looking at atheists, they sound like they're confident sometimes. They sound like they're confident even when the, th when the facts are against them. And the reason for that is because they have priors. Their prior probability for God is basically zero, at least for some of them. And if that's the case, we shouldn't be worrying about that. We shouldn't be worrying that if we can't convince them, then we must be wrong, because they're unconvincible. We shouldn't be worrying that, well, they say it, so there must be some truth to it. Because they're looking at facts with a mindset that will not allow certain conclusions. And if the truth happens to be in those conclusions, that means that they will not allow the truth. And, you know, we need, to, we need to stop worrying about it. We need to stop. And in fact, we need to stop allowing those people to define science. Now, maybe we can't do that for the general population because there may be enough people who agree with them that we're stuck with that. But, but certainly in our own minds, we should not be, and, and I think um, in our own discussions of science with other Christians, with other Adventists, with other you know, people of faith, we should not be saying, well, but you know, all these people disagree with us, so we must be wrong. It's, it's a mistake. It's a trap. And we need to avoid it. And realizing that at least for some of these people, it really is all about the prior probability. And the prior probability won't let them see anything. It won't even let them acknowledge the obvious evidence. You know, my comment uh, to Mark Frank, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the show? It, you have the origin of life. It is highly unlikely. <coughs> you know, to the gazillions of zeros <coughs> that it's that it could happen by chance. <coughs> An intelligent designer we know not only can, but in one case has been able to produce long strings of DNA that do a marvelous job of coding for the proteins that an organism needs. We know intelligence can do it. We don't know that uh, that uh, nature can do it on its own, and all the evidence we have points against it. And yet, these people insist that that's not even evidence for God. Now, maybe it's not sufficient evidence. You could start with the prior that's low enough. But when Mark Frank says there's no evidence, he's blind. And when other people say there's not evidence, they're blind. And we should stop letting blind people define for us what a rainbow looks like. Uh, a couple of comments and then one bit in the back. Uh, yeah. Just to say we, we can, uh, we're, we're talking about this uh, chance of life originated one chance out of 10 to the 1,000th, what, 16 or 18? Uh, yeah, and that's yeah. with generous assumptions, yeah. hugely generous but, assumptions. But uh, that's just the origin of life, uh, a very restrictive part doesn't of Doesn't count the Cambrian explosion, doesn't count uh, monkeys to humans, you know, the Y chromosome rearrangement, I mean, all that stuff. But. Beyond all that, you mentioned earlier this 10 to the 123, which is Polkinghorne's uh, uh, figure on the universe. Uh, th this, I, I think it was Polkinghorne. Uh, 10 to the 10 to the 123? You mean you're talking yeah. about the, the... The chance of the universe uh, being yeah. accurate, being yeah. accurate and so on. Uh, 
that has to be added to this. So you know, you sure you, you're you're at 1100 and 12. I mean, it just goes on. It gets worse and worse the more you look. And the only way around it is to say that everything that mathematically can happen will happen. That that there are so many universes that uh, that uh. that science is rendered meaningless. At least. A posterior science is rendered meaningless. Uh, multiverse is a, a convenient uh, cop-out. Yeah. Uh, it is not science. If you uh, design science you as the study of the reproducible, mm -hmm. there is no reproducible evidence that can persuade you that there's more than one universe. Uh, uh, there's, there's no solid evidence that there's more than one universe. And that, uh, <laughs> there can be no solid evidence that there's more than one universe. It's, it's worse than that. By definition, of course. <laughs> we, are, we have now thoroughly entered into philosophical speculation. Uh, there and well, then in the back. Yeah, it, um, basically you're, you know, you're arguing science and it, it's to most of the people uh, it's their judgments or their conclusions are not scientific anyway. They're they're emotional, uh, based on maybe how they were raised, maybe tradition, or they're or they're just plain emotional. That's it. And um, so you can't argue the point logically to them because you're not touching their emotions. You know. Uh, so until they can drop their emotions for for a moment and and see, gee, maybe I should logically think this out. Uh, you know, their probability, I'm looking at your probabilities up here, you know, 10 to the minus 300 or 600. I mean, their 10 to, the, or their probability is, is the, the power of infinity. Well, that's right. There, there is no, you cannot argue with it a person like that. It is not measurably different from zero. Exactly. By, by calculus definition, it is zero. Right. And quick I think we'll let this be the last comment. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> quick comment for what you had said, that you can't convince them and you think you're wrong when they're still trying to argue with you. When usually that happens, I usually think of Mark Twain when he said, don't argue with an idiot. He'll drag you down to his level and he'll beat you with experience. <laughs> and then I usually go back to Psalms 14. The fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. At that point, why do you keep arguing with him to bring you down to his level? Well, you know, my opinion is what happens is the people decide there is no God. And once you do that, the logical consequences of that require you to become a fool. Anyway, so next week... We'll be talking about a proof that human minds are not computers. Uh, if that interests you, come on back. We'll have some fun.